What is color grading? This is one of those questions that seems really obvious until you go to answer it. And then you find yourself five minutes later, 10 minutes later, still trying to add this or that to your definition to account for all the different things that we do when we are color grading. So what I want to do today is start with a simple and complete definition of color grading. And then I want to show you how my definition of color grading informs my practice as a professional colorist when I'm working in DaVinci Resolve. So that's what we're going to do today. Let's start with that simple definition. What is color grading? Here's my definition. Color grading is taking an image from its original captured state and shaping it into its reproduction state, meaning what we see on a display at the end of the journey. That's it. That describes everything that I do as a professional colorist. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot to think about, a lot of considerations, a lot of techniques, a lot of ideas that are involved in pulling that off successfully. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of this video talking about today. We're going to look at how this plays out inside of DaVinci Resolve. Before we dive in, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, make sure you do. I put out two new videos a week on the craft of color grading. We do a live Q&A call every Friday where we talk about the subjects we've been exploring that week. So lots of cool stuff that you don't want to miss. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notifications. Let's take a look here inside of Resolve and talk about what exactly color grading is. So we now have our definition, right? Color grading is taking an image from its original capture state and shaping it into its reproduction state. So what are we looking at right now? We have a bunch of images in their original capture state. So what is the very first thing that we are going to do if we want to shape these images into their reproduction state? Well, we're going to start with a strong technical foundation because really that definition that we gave has two separate components to it. There's a technical component to it. There's the particular specifications of the camera that we shot on and the display that we are mapping to. There's a lot of technical stuff in uh, the craft of color grading. There's also a creative component. So part of where we're going to find success when we are color grading is identifying when we need a technical solution and when we need a creative solution. But our foundation for color grading is we want to build that path to the reproduction state using a sound technical foundation. What do I mean when I say that? What I'm really talking about is something called color management. And really all that color management is, is taking our image from what the camera saw and transforming it into what our display can reproduce. That's something that we can actually rely on color science and on technical aspects of color grading to give us our foundation for. So let's see what that looks like. If I go into any of the images that I've got right now, let's actually look at all of them. I'm just going to shift click all 15 of these images. And I'm going to right click on these thumbnails and I'm going to uncheck bypass color management, which I currently have turned on. This is going to turn on my color management, which, as I said, it's going to take our image from what the camera saw and transform it into what our display can reproduce. Now, setting this up takes a couple of minutes and uh, it's something that you need to learn how to do. We've got lots of great content here on the channel that is going to help you learn how to do that. So I encourage you to check that out if you're brand new to color management. But this is your foundation. This is step one. Without this, the task of transforming or of taking your image from its original capture state and shaping it into its reproduction state. If you are skipping over this part, you are making a huge compromise that is almost impossible to recover from. It's almost impossible to get the results you can get using this method without it. At least you're not going to get the same uh, quality of results or it's going to take you much longer to do so. Okay, so that's your foundation. It's the technical foundation of color management. Now, where do we go from here? You might think, okay, great, that makes a lot of sense, Colin. Now that I've got that foundation in place, let's start grading. Let's start moving stuff around, right? Not quite. I'm going to make you be a little more patient, just like I try to be patient in my color grading practice, because at what point we enter into our color grade, the context, the foundation that we have when we begin our color grade is going to inform a huge part of how successful we are when we do begin that process. So there's one more thing that I want to do before I'm really ready to dive in and begin grading individual shots. And that is to provide what we can think of as the sort of creative counterpart to the color management that we just set up. Remember, color management is essentially technically technical in nature. So we're just taking what the camera saw, transforming it into what our display can show. But there's really no creative character to any of these images uh, as we go through here, as you can see. They're just looking correct for our display. They're what are called what we would say is normalized for our display. So what we want to do is get a 
macro level creative component in place, a look in place before we start grading individual shots. Here's how I tackle that. We're going to go over to the timeline level of the node graph. And there are lots of different uh, places where I could source my look. But in this case, I'm going to go into my CKC Voyager subfolder here. This Voyager LUT pack is a pack that I released earlier this year that is designed to do exactly what I'm going to use it for today, which is to impart creative character onto my images inside of a color managed pipeline, specifically a DaVinci wide gamut color managed pipeline. That's what I'm looking for. And that's why these are going to be a good fit for me today. So what I'm going to do is go in here into my essentials pack. And I'm going to look through these 17 options that I have here and look for one that provides me a strong creative or preferential foundation under which I can now do my grading. All right. Now, how do I know which one to select? I'm just going to look at several of them and I'm going to see what I like. I'm going to see what I dig. This is uh, the first encounter that we're having with a principle that's really important to me in color grading. Color correcting uh, or color grading rather is not about being right or wrong. It's about what feels right. It's about what your client, your collaborator wants. It's about what you're looking for, but it's not about getting it right. It's not about being correct. It's about uh, getting what feels good for your creative intent and your client's creative intent. So how do I know which of these is quote unquote right or wrong? I don't. In fact, none of them are right and none of them are wrong. It's just about what feels good to my eye and the eye of the people who I'm working with. Okay. So let's just flip through a couple of these and find something that we dig. We're starting off with a black and white. That's kind of interesting. Maybe not what I want to go with for this image. This Aracon look feels really good. By the way, something that I will do when I'm auditioning a look is I'm going to flip through and look at how it's uh, treating all the shots in my timeline. And we actually have kind of a assortment of shots here in this timeline. These shots are obviously not all shot by the same person or are not necessarily meant to be edited together into a sequence. But for our purposes, we are just going to look for a look that feels pretty good on all these shots. And as I flip around and look through these, I'm starting to look at which of them really serves the image best. So far, I really like this Argus LUT. And we can continue to go through. I have a feeling camera is going to be the one that we stick with here. Yeah, that's feeling really nice. So you can see like on any of these images, when I go off and then on, this is giving me a stronger creative foundation, at least to my eye. This is, I would rather see this image than that image. And I haven't even begun grading yet. So this is an important part of my practice when I'm color grading. I'm looking to basically cheat. If I can get color management that's making my image look more proper than it did before, closer to what I want it to be than it did before, and then I can impart an overall creative look using a tool like my Voyager Essentials Pack to get a vibe on my images, to get a preferential creative reproduction that I like more on the images. I want to do that. I'm looking to make my life as easy as possible when I get into actual shot level color grading, because if the images all already look really, really good, that means I can make them look that much better when I'm actually going through and grading things shot by shot. So this is an important part of the process that gets often overlooked when we're talking about color grading. Color grading is really a, 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 the process of shaping our original image into our reproduction state of the image. And we want to start kind of from what I would call macro to micro. This is something that I talk about in my book, The Colorist 10 Commandments, macro beats micro. So if we have an adjustment or a manipulation or a process that can affect more than one shot in a positive way, that is fundamentally more valuable than a process or a manipulation that only affects one shot in a positive way. Makes sense, right? So really, that's what we're observing when we do uh, our creative look at this overall timeline level is we are observing the macro beats micro principle. All right. So we're going to go with this for now. This is going to be our look. I'm just going to label it and call it look. And now let's talk about grading these individual shots. So a couple of other principles that I want to talk about. But here's one that I'm going to start with. Let's go over to shot number three for a moment. And you might notice I have a template node graph built for uh, all of uh, these clips here in my timeline. This template node graph is currently empty. There's nothing happening, but it's giving me a structure to fill out to work within so that I can hit every shot and work through the same basic set of considerations in the same way every time. Consistency, it's a big part of uh, finding success in color grading. So here on this shot, this is the kind of shot that when I was first learning my craft as a colorist, 
someone might have told me, oh, that's overexposed or that doesn't look quite right on your scopes over here. You need to correct the image. You need to color correct. In fact, color correction is a term that's often used interchangeably with color grading. It's a term I don't much care for because when I hear correct, my immediate question is, well, what's wrong? And why is it wrong? And why are we having to correct things? So when I look at this image, I just want to emphasize to you, there's nothing in need of correction. There's nothing wrong with this image. The only thing wrong or right with anything that we are seeing about this image right now is how well it agrees or disagrees with our creative intent. Does that make sense? It's a subtle distinction, but it's an important one. You should feel free to push your image in whatever direction that you want to, but not because you heard that that's correct or you heard that what you have now is a problem. You should be pushing in the direction of your creative intent and solely in the direction of your creative intent. So if I wanted to expose this image down, I could go to my exposure node, grab my offset, which I'm going to make sure that you can see over here and expose this down. That would be fine. It would also be fine if I was looking at this image and I said, hey, I kind of like that dreamy, airy, more open look that I have here. And I actually want to do more of that. I want to open it up even further. That would be fine as well. It's all about your creative intent. But what we want to do as colorists is have principles, best practices that we can consistently use so that we are able to consistently achieve our creative intent. So let's go back over here to shot number one and look at how this plays out on another shot. So I'm going to work my exposure here a little bit. I'm now going to go uh, to my contrast ratio. I like to use contrast and pivot to control my contrast. You could also use your lift and gain. I'm now going to go over to my balance and look to kind of max out my color separation here. Another sort of uh, counter uh, to the wisdom that you will often hear about color grading point that I like to emphasize when it comes to balance. I don't really care about white balance or black balance. I'm not trying to get neutral shadows or neutral highlights or make sure that my scopes look a particular way. I'm trying to do two things when I go to balance something. I'm trying to make skin tone look as good as possible because that's what matters most to the human eye more than virtually any other color in any frame. If there are people in the frame, make those people look as good as you possibly can. That is a bulletproof prescription for grading great looking images. So that's my first priority. Make the skin tone look great. Second priority, max out color separation, which you can see in this vector scope is really a matter of allowing the image to straddle one or more of the quadrants of my color wheel here. So I'm ending up kind of getting a net cooling effect. And to be honest with you, I didn't really start this balancing adjustment going, oh, this image needs to be cooled off. It's too warm. I just started adjusting my trackball until I liked what I was seeing in my skin tone and in terms of color separation. And when I say color separation, what I mean is how much contrast, how much distinction there is between warm colors, cool colors, uh, et cetera, in the frame. So these different colors, how well do they separate or blend from one another? I've optimized that color separation by placing my balance in the way that I have here. Okay. Now I want to emphasize something. We did a lot of setup just to get to this stage. And thus far, I've only made three simple corrections in three simple nodes here inside of Resolve. Here's the plus side of all that setup and all of that fussing over what's the best way to get things working initially. Where we are right now, I'm like 80% of the way to what I'm going to end up doing with this color grade. If this is an image that I'm grading in the context of a real client session, I'm way more than halfway there at this point. I've got my good fundamentals in place. I've got an overall technical and creative pipeline that supports the creative agenda uh, that I have as well as uh, that my client has. So I'm way more than halfway there just with three simple adjustments here in my node tree. And that's another principle that I talk about in my book, The Colorist 10 Commandments, that is a core part of my practice as a colorist. Simplicity beats complexity. There's all kinds of complex things here inside of Resolve, complex tools that do fascinating, interesting, complicated things for our images. And I know all of them at this point, and I've used all of them at various points, and I'm glad they are in Resolve. However, I am always, always, always looking for the simplest possible solution to my needs, because that's going to mean I can do things more quickly, which means I can grade more shots, which means I have more time. I'm always battling for time as a colorist. You're going to be battling for time if you're color grading for clients or even for yourself. It's all about accomplishing that goal, getting the image from its captured state into its reproduction state within a finite period of time. If you were to remove that boundary of having all the time in the world and you don't need to get it done in a particular window, then frankly, a lot of what I'm telling you today wouldn't apply because it's like, well, 
You can do it optimally. Maybe you do it suboptimally, but you just spend a little bit more time doing it and you get to the same result. Great. Who cares? But the reality when we're color grading is we're always against some kind of clock. Maybe it's a brutal clock. Maybe we've got a little more time, but we're always working under some kind of deadline. That's why I'm so insistent on optimizing my processes so that the time I do have is best spent and gets me the absolute best result that I can get. Okay. So that is the fundamentals of my color grading process right there. We are going to go about this task of shaping our image from its capture state into its reproduction state, starting with color management, then moving on to an overall look, and then really focusing in on our fundamentals up here in the upper section of this node graph, like I'm doing here. And let's just briefly talk about where things do go from here, because I want to emphasize, I'm of course not done color grading at this point. I've just established a really good foundation. So let's go to a new shot here and work our fundamentals, hit that exposure. In this case, that contrast ratio feels great to me. Let's go over to our balance and just optimize that, kind of max out that color separation. That's actually feeling pretty darn good in and of itself. And I'm pretty happy with uh, the little bit of a warm push that I'm seeing in this image as well. So maybe that's fine. And let's just play through this. So here's what I want to do in this case. I want to guide the eye a little bit more into uh, the center of the frame where the uh, man and the woman on the date are uh, inhabiting, right? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to the secondaries branch of my node graph, add a new circular power window, and I'm going to set my aspect to 100, which is essentially going to turn this image or this window rather into just a flat horizontal grad. And if I go over here to my invert window button, now what I'm going to be able to do if I turn on my highlight mode by hitting shift H or going to this little magic wand is I can see the area of the image that this window is affecting. And you can see I'm now affecting everything outside of the window as opposed to everything inside of the window. And all I'm going to do now is go over to my gain, which is here in your primaries and just pull that down a little bit. Okay. Maybe choke this in a little bit more. So this is a great example of what I use this bottom branch of my template node tree for. This is where I perform my secondaries. Secondaries are very appropriately named because they come second to our primaries. Our primaries is what we were doing up here. Secondaries is what you do after to finesse, to nuance, to guide the eye. So you can see if I turn this outline off and we just look at kind of the net results of what we've done, we already had a nice good reproduction of this image. We've come a long way from where we were initially. There is your initial grade right there. If I turn off everything, here's where we were. Now, not even your initial grade. This is what the, what the original camera negative was captured in. And if I turn these pieces back on, here is where we've netted out. So we've come a long way, and I would argue most of the way to what this image is going to look and feel like in its final state. But our secondaries uh, se segment of the node graph is critical for really finessing and nuancing and tying those things together. So I want to get to this point as quickly as possible so that I can make those value adds, I can make those tweaks, I can enhance and finesse and nuance the image. Getting there is not an accident. It involves strategy and it involves using the principles that I've shown you today. So I hope that gives you a good overview of what I see color grading as and how my specific and simple definition of this craft informs what I actually do inside of Resolve to get the best possible results in the shortest period of time. If you've enjoyed this video, again, encourage you to subscribe. Lots of great videos like this coming out here on the channel. If you want to discuss this subject or any of the other cool subjects we discuss here on the channel in more depth and get your questions answered, I encourage you to join me for my Friday live session, Grade School, where we do a one hour Q&A. We always have a blast in there. I'd love to see you in there. And if not there, then I will see you here on the channel for our next video.